Chris BBI here. I want to stop and say thanks. Thanks for tuning in and checking out whatever the video is about that's about ready to come up next. If you could take a minute and hit subscribe, I'd greatly appreciate it. And if you enjoy what you've seen here, make sure to hit the like button. We'd greatly appreciate your support. Anyhow, guys, all that aside, let's get on with the show. Well, welcome back. Uh, this is going to be the beginning of part two. I've got all the stock footage that I've stored up for three months out of my four months, five months out of my system. Five months, God. Out of my system. You guys just got done watching that. Um, the first thing I want to cover is I got these really neat boards. This is from uh, RF Junk. RFJunk.com. Um, this is with this and two other parts that I got from RF Junk. Um, are the only things that are in this box that weren't either ordered, sourced, or manufactured in-house. And we're going to go over some of the things that I worked on last Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday. And we're going to start getting ourselves more and more current. <clears throat> this is how we're going to control our bias. With the relay, the center tap of our filament transformer, which I'll get to here in a minute. And uh, <laughs> we're going to tap into this, and then with the use of our our amp meter we're going to set our zero signal with the use of this board but this is a neat board that was produced by Chris over at RF Junk very high quality very easy to assemble might be another product that you uh, you thriving amp builders out there might want to seek out now now that we got that out of the way let's start over here so these were a pain to find and these were a pain to manufacture we used high temp red fiberglass board to mount these on um, in-house we manufactured standoffs which we did out of pure copper and we can get away with using a metal insulate or a metal standoff because we're going to an insulated material the fiberglass so how this works is this sits between the rectifier board and the capacitor bank and all this is is a shock absorber this is called a glitch resistor you guys these are two 10 ohm resistors that are mounted down. These are 300 watts a piece, so a total of 600 watts worth of dissipation. And the idea with this is if there's a glitch that takes place, a short, an arc over, the tube breaks down, something fails inside the RF deck, like the blocking cap, or we have a problem with one of our plate chokes, whatever, this is a level of protection. And what this does is takes the electrical impulse, the shock to the electrical system, and it dissipates it through a little bit of resistance and it snubs the energy flow that will be flowing back down the positive lead post the cap to our diode boards. Now I built two of these. Here's one, here's two. Now in operation, these things have a tendency to get a little bit warm. Hence the reason for the need of the big high flow 120 millimeter fans per board. And they're gonna force air directly across both of these resistors. And we're gonna cool them. Now, I want a different path with this particular bit of technology. This is our bleeder board. Once again, everything is some of its conductive components like the bodies of the, the submerged resistors, but we can mount it down to a high temp fiberglass board like this because it's gonna act as our insulator. This is constantly going to get warm. These are 100 watt 20K resistors. So we're crespin right on the our power. How do I describe this? What's the appropriate term? Because I know somebody's going to try and jump on this and act like the fool. You have a power dis, uh, dissipation chart that you can apply to the circuit, and this is a calculated amount of resistance. Okay. You don't want to be so aggressive that you're actually going to pull away from your working load. But remember, our power supply is like five amps, six amps worth of current. That we're going to be pulling into and we're only going to be pulling maybe a sixteenth of an amp out of the circuit I'm just I'm making numbers up off the top of my head I can give you a calculated amount of resistance and a calculated amount of amperage consumption but what this does is when we shut down the power supply it's going to take all the electrons that are inside of our high voltage electric filtering electrolytic not electrolytic oil filled capacitor and it's going to dissipate them back to ground making the capacitor making the capacitor neutralized which is going to make the circuit safe it's our bleeder board, built two of them. 
Now, if I can get my puppy dog to move, 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 bud. We're going to come over here and we're going to talk about these two gems. This is my rectification boards I built. Now, if you follow me on Facebook, you'll would have seen these pictures start coming up on the production of this thing. Um, probably Wednesday of last week. Um, this is a serious break from traditional design. It's okay because the fundamentals still stay the same. All the diodes point a certain direction, you inject the AC at the certain points, and guess what you get out the other end? That's right. Bob's your uncle, DC. Now, each one of these legs has got, let's count them off together, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20. 20 diodes per leg, two legs or two strands per leg so there's 40 diodes those are 10 a 10s okay which stands for 10 amp thousand volt now we have to plan for the worst pray for the best and what i mean by that is that the highest setting on the output of this thing we've got 7600 volts ac coming in through these two tabs tab here and tab here this is the back side of one of the boards this is the front side of one of the boards and i've got them mounted up to these little aluminum stands that i built what I thought was amazing to me, absolutely amazing to me, I've been welding since I have been six or seven years old, eight years old. I do own a very nice, nice welder, and I've got some very, very nice welding equipment, and I literally tacked these things together and just threw some, tra uh, some passes down on the aluminum, and it was fun to watch everybody on Facebook kind of unspool a little bit and have lots and lots of conversation about the welding technique that I used. Some of the welds was a little bit low in amperage, and some of the welds, um, I wouldn't say perfect, but this is all the weight these have to support. Each one of these boards weighs about maybe four and a half ounces, five ounces. I used huge, thick angle. Let me show you the pictures. Okay, so <laughs> now that you've seen the pictures, everybody was, oh, well, you know, I enjoy tips like that because I'm not going to lie to you guys. I don't weld every day. I solder and bend metal and build ornate pieces of artwork every day. And welding thing is secondary. It's not back like when I was welding every day, all day long. <laughs> when I was a kid, when I was 18, 20 something years ago. So, yes, my skills aren't in top shape, but I've got no undercut welds and everything is pretty clean so I'm pretty sure these will last forever along with the main plate for the amp deck I'm pretty sure that that will put up with about any amount of punishment that the future owners of these boxes will ever be able to put the thing through so built it all out of aluminum angle um, everything is spaced three inches apart um, here there is a six inch gap and here is a six inch mm -hmm. gap as well oh I know you're bored mister Sorry, I've got my lab out here with me. He's chilling, hanging out with Dad. So, the way this works is we take our AC, our, our AC high voltage AC, and we put it in on this tab on each leg. We go through our one-way pixie valves, otherwise known as our diodes, and we get our positive output and our, our negative output of our DC signal. Okay. Now, what everybody's going to try and flip about for a hot minute is oh my god the legs aren't evenly spaced and they don't tie together that means each leg is going to have uh, separated separated load on it wrong if we look the AC signal comes from the middle of this board down here remember this board is also over here on the back side of this board it comes from the middle and it hits this strand of diodes first this strand of diodes first but on our output side on the DC side of things We've got now gone in the same distance, same amount of surface area, same and same on the on the opposite side. We've put in we've put our output side equally spaced, and that's going to be closer to this leg. Thusly, it cancels out the differentiation of distance from here to here. And what I'm talking about is the voltage and current is going to have a tendency to want to run up this leg because it's going to have the path of least resistance making this leg and this leg almost mute but because the load is on this side 
and the input signal of voltage is on this side, it cancels them out because as far as the electrons are concerned, the pathway from here to here is the same distance up each leg, which is very important that we recognize that. Other little tip I'm going to give you is do not tie all of these together. Do not. Um, I did this beautiful ornate board for Vader. Um, I think I called it backyard chemistry and it was where me and my kid we sat down and we learned how to, I taught her how to etch boards. Um, we etched out this beautifully ornate board that had all these solder pads on it and I soldered a ton of diodes on the thing. I think I had three diodes per string and then I had like 14 freaking strings and I, I went way super overkill. Well, we ended up having a breakdown issue where all the, the diodes were tied together. Now, in theory, in my brain, the way I think about it, it wouldn't matter if all the diodes are tied together at each one of the... The only way that you can accurately and controlling the circuit positively add amperage to the circuit itself is to have each one of these strings separated out. So if you have a problem in this string, you still have this string of diodes in function. Or if you tie everything together and you have a problem in this string, it's going to thusly affect this other string of diodes. So then you can never isolate where you had the breakdown. Um, the quality of diodes today is such that we don't need to worry about putting mobs, which is a form of capacitor across each one of the legs, to help us have balance. I, I found that that is not necessary. I would say 40, 50 years ago, the quality of diodes were not that we have and enjoy and get to use today and you would want to add a little bit of capacitance from here to here across each one of the strings to add balance. Now if you go and you look in the URL handbook or any other electronical reference manual they are going to suggest that you use capacitors. Um, I found that it's not necessary and and some of the bigger things I've built we've gone as high as you know 15, 16,000 volts. Um, a project that I'm going to take on not too long from now, probably in about a month or so, I am going to build a rectifier board that is going to run somewhere around 20,000 volts at about 9.5 amps. And that's for, well, the largest amplifier that's ever been built for, yeah, we're going to go crazy. I'm not going to say I'm doing this with, it's not for me, it's not for my use, I'm not interested in it. Where I sit in the food chain of how, who's got the most power makes me perfectly happy, my 40,000. 80,000 bird, if you can't hear me on freaking 80,000 bird, I don't have mother nature with you, so it's just pointless. Just pointless. So, now, I've got all this beautiful hardware assembled. It's time for us to create a spot inside the amp deck and get all this stuff mounted. Now, since you guys have seen the last video, in this video, the uh, amp deck itself has actually changed significantly, um, so let me grab the, the camera off the tripod and we're going to go over and we're going to take a quick look at that, and we'll walk you through what we've added. Hi. <laughs> so, my little man's going to join me down here on the floor. This is our filament transformer. This is our 100 amp um, variable tap transformer that we've discussed in the previous segment of the video. Um, it's got a center tap on it which is here. Hi bud, you don't need to give me kisses. Hey, Dad's working. Dad's working. Lay down. Lay down. Lay, lay down. Good boy. Okay, so this is our 100 amp filament transformer. It's way over spec for what we're going to use it for on this particular build. Now, if we decide that we're going to go to a pair of 3000s, this transformer is perfect. Um, if we're going to run a single six, this transformer is perfect. Um, it would be right on the edge of what this transformer can actually do to run a 10. So if we went to a pair of sixes or we went to a 10, we would probably want to change this transformer, but this is perfect. This is literally double the amount of current. This thing can produce double the amount of current that the filament on the 3000 can pull, which is 56 amps. So two 3000s, we're looking at 110, 112 amp, which is well within the spec capability of this transformer. We mounted up our contactors. Click, 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 click mount up our contactors. This is going to control our low voltage side and our 110 volt switch on and off for like our blowers, our fans, our meters, and that kind of thing. Um, I am going to utilize all switching technology, all switching power supplies. We are not going to use any iron core for that. So I have this space 
this dead space and it's the same over here we're in the same position with uh, amplifier number two we have this dead space that we can utilize that we're going to be able to mount stuff but we've actually got all this room up here as well so today what we've got to figure out is where we're going to put our bias board remember our bias is going to be switched from here through our board to ground back to the cabinet and that's how we're going to control the tube turning on and off and sitting at idle and control our class of operation. It's all done through the center tap on the filament transformer. So what I have to figure out later today, as soon as I'm done with this little portion of the segment, is one, how am I going to melt, mount in our rack system for our shelves, our shelves that are going to go here, okay? Two, how we're going to mount down our high voltage capacitor, which is very important because this has to stay fixed. This is like an electrical bomb. We short these two leads together with it being fully charged. We're going to have ourselves a huge arc and a big explosion. So we're going to have to mount this down firmly. And then I have to mount all that other hardware that I built somewhere in this space somehow. But the first step to figuring out that puzzle is I need to build the shelving unit into these boxes, into each one of these cabinets so that I can figure out what my spacing is going to be top to bottom, vertically and horizontally. So I have room for my amp deck up here. And then down here, I have room for all of my control stuff, my low voltage controls, my power supplies, um, the bleeders and all that kind of stuff. I want to keep all down in this space. So it means there's probably going to be pieces of all thread that go through here, the base and go up and support things in the air. Then we're going to have a rack system that goes in here for the shelving unit, which we can also then put things on. The goal is, though, to keep the airspace through here fairly, fairly open because the strongest point in this whole cabinet is the top of that transformer and the plate that's on the bottom of this. And I have to be able to facilitate my customer being able to transport this thing, which means taking the sides off, running a ratchet strap through this and strapping this down to some kind of like four by four on this plate, not suspended on the wheels. So it can go on a vehicle that bounces down the road and a couple hundred pounds doesn't end up breaking the wheels. And I don't end up bending the cabinet, which is very possible with that much weight inside the unit. Small problems today. So on that note, I'm going to take off and I'm going to go put things together. I will try to come back with a one or two more segments before the end of the day to explain to you the step-by-step -step process of my thinking. I shall return. Let's start out down here. So we got our shelf in. We got our bracket system in. And now I'm not going to lie to you guys. The instructions for the shelving system suck. So I just kind of had to literally play it by ear. And um, this post would, would have come down and made contact with this 220 volt lead here. So I went ahead and made the choice to trim it off there. and I replicated it over here. Everything is a one-to-one -one copy. Now, I've spent an insane amount of time today standing here doing this. Literally standing here going, well, if I move the cabinet forward, and have it sitting like so, I can make the front face plate look like this. But then on the back side, where am I going to put my dual line sections? And then I'm going to put my blower. Well, do I want to put my blower inside the cabinet or do I... hours upon hours? And see, I don't even have this enclosure sitting in there properly at the moment. It's supposed to sit this direction. So, what I've settled on here, you guys, now this is orientated correctly, is we're going to bring this forward as far as we can to be somewhat even, even with the front. Because remember, I'm going to have a Lexan sheet that comes up to about here on the amp deck. So, all the controls and everything are going to be over here, on, so on, and so on probably put the bleeders up here the bleeder circuits gonna go right in here someplace I do believe and I'll put my rectifiers in here um, I will probably mount the high voltage cap somewhere back in here and that'll put our glitch resistors in here 
Lots of room for clearance. But this has taken hours and hours of trying different things and standing here thinking about it. And that'll leave me a lot of room on the back for the dual line sections. And I think I'm gonna put the blower inside the deck, which is a lot more work, but it's gonna be super cool. All right, keep moving on, moving on. Here we go. Hold on a second. This is what I've been doing for the last hour. Do I want to mount the diode board like this? to mount the diode board like this. What are the pros and the cons of this versus also having to install my bleeder and also having to install my glitch resistors plus my oil flow cap. Where am I going to stick it? How much work is it going to be? My current design Remember, there's going to be a sheet of Lexan that goes over the front of this. Remember, camera isn't the best thing of showing field of depth. So that'll be a two inch and a half to two inch clearance from this. I don't want to get too close to my time on circuit. I don't want to fry that. That's real important. This is where all the magic happens right here, right? One way pixie valve. You know what I mean? I think I'm going to put my bleeders up in here, up underneath this shelf, up above the transformer. Yeah, I think that's what I'm going to do. Okay, now to go do the three or four hours to get that done. Yay! Work. Whoop, whoop. Well, here we are once again. So. I spent a great deal of time last night sitting here staring at Amp A and Amp B, um, the Exorcist and the Demon. I had a friend of mine point out to me that I'm not saying that very clearly. And I've spent a great deal of time trying to figure out how I can make all the big parts that I just built fit in here comfortably. So I finally settled down on where I want to mount the rectifier board. Now remember there's going to be a sheet of uh, Lexan separating the universe from the high voltage board and we got our bleeder boards installed up in here and then we got all our cable routing installed all the way around the decks and installed and locked tied it in and in place so tonight I've got to put the glitch resistor in and then I got to build a shelf like in here in this space in this space down here to hold the oil fill capacitor and 12 volt power supplies to power all the lights and fans and this kind of stuff so it just takes a lot of time of planning on where I want to put things because I'm only going to get one shot and I don't want to have to come back and drill any more holes or rearrange anything but your high voltage comes this is your primary side so then your secondary side your high voltage comes out of here and it hits your rectifier board okay now this is super overkill like this rectifier board is like an extreme overkill which is good that means we never have to worry about this failing and um, on this side we've got our DC outs over here is our AC in same thing over here and there's plenty of real estate this is 1500 volt wire so there's plenty of space around all of these wires and they're not in contact with anything that might be possibly conductive even though in theory you could lay this right down against the edge of the cabinet but we don't want to press our luck so the reason that the glitch resistors aren't in here yet is because I ran out of nylon. Well, I put a hard hit on my Ace Hardware for all their nylon and now we're going to go to a different size nylon to hold the glitch resistor in place. And then we're going to start punching holes down here in the boards of the cabinets so I can get the shelf shimmied in here and still have room to work on all the contactors and get everything wired up. So that's where we're at. I'll have more for you guys here in just a little bit. I shall return. Okay, well, I figured now that I've got the glitch resistors installed, I need to go ahead and I need to wire up my filament contactor and my AC220 switch contactor. This contactor will run the blower, 
um, the switch mode power supplies for these fans and the lights and all that kind of stuff all be run from here off of this contactor so when I click the on over here click on what this will do is it'll latch this contactor first it'll bring all the DC stuff online make it so that we can key the box make it so that the fans come on the cooling fans and the blower for the, the tube and it's also going to do the time on timer all from here then the next switch down is going to bring on our filament which is this lead here and this is a 110 device filament that is 100 amp 7.5 volt 110 transformer okay well when this is come online that like I said it it'll kick on your ability to be able to key the amplifier and what I mean by that is all the the relays inside this box are going to be run off DC current okay it's it's a lot safer in a lot of different ways which we're not going to get into right now but that allows us to bring our, di our bias which comes off of this center leg of the filament the transformer it allows us to bring that bias circuit online as well so this will bring the tube on third and final switch is going to activate these two contactors which will allow us to bring our high voltage on independent of these other two contactors and we want to do that for a reason <clears throat> the reason we want to do that is if we have a problem in our high voltage we want to be able to neutralize and isolate the high voltage but protect the tube and protect the filament by being able to keep our filament current steady and keeping our blower motor running to cool the tube down so <clears throat> we have to separate those two universes so this is one universe this is another now, before I get too far along from here, I'd like to keep on wiring and do the 12 volt side for the fans. But what I'm gonna do is now I've gotta copy what I've done here down to the nut bolt screw and how I have this laid out over here on this one. So, <laughs> fun times, right? It's just mind boringly, this is just mind boring to me. Makes my brain wild just shut off and shut down so our 220 leads we got two 220 leads that come off of this contactor they're fed by number six wire so there's no way that we're gonna be able to overstress these 14 gauge wires that come out of the contactors there's more than ample amount of current that come from our distribution strip this is our filament lead and when I'm done all of this will have tags on it so I have a little printed tag here and here and a printed tag here and a printed tag here stating what they are that way the future user isn't going to be guessing since we're not going with a, a mystical color code system like some other amp companies have done we're going to actually do labels on everything so we get this done over here on this box then i can wire up the 12 volt this stuff here i can wire up the 12 volt and then i can go put in my shelf then i can put in my oil filled capacitor and i can put in my 12 volt switching supplies and once I get that done, then it'll be time to move on to the amp deck, which sits up here. Um, once we get the oil filled in, that'll make the high voltage circuit 99% um, complete. Um, get the 12 volt supplies in. That'll make all my low voltage about 99% complete, um, short of running the, the switches and that kind of thing. And then we're gonna jump over and start doing the amp deck which would be mounting the tube and that kind of thing and getting the holes cut for the blower and all that kind of fun jazz. And the last thing that we'll do is we're gonna do our metering circuit and then we're gonna do our power control, which is gonna be in our on off switches on the Lexan sheet that's on the front of this thing. So right on schedule, right on track. Next step in this particular enclosure is shelf and oil fill capacitor and 12 volt switchers. Over here is to run all of this which took about two hours to do, so I'm expecting to spend another two or three hours over here on this one copying it. All right, that's where we're at. And you know, everything's labeled, and of course everything is made with Teflon wire, because, you know, we like Teflon. It puts up with heat, and it doesn't like to burn up, and you know, good stuff. Well, this is a monumental labor of love, I'm here to tell you, getting these two contactors wired up, but it's all done. It's all bibbed up, and, uh, I'm going to take some time, I'm going to do the 12 volt side of things up here. We're going to route the wire around and over and probably down this post to the power supply section. We'll have a 
little big coil of wire sitting up here for a hot minute. Um, yeah. Last but not least is to build this shelf and then start mounting stuff to it. We've got our uh, oil fields to put in. Got matching brackets to install those and hold them down. Um, we're going to use industrial 3M tape to secure them perfectly, but we made them so they're short enough, the brackets that is, so that they perfectly fit, but they give us a half inch gap on each side for us to tension these in place. It's very important that these don't move. We'll probably put a little piece of 3M tape in here and another piece of 3M tape here to make sure it's perfectly secure. Um, I hate using double side stick tape, but it's good in certain applications. Now you got to do this kind of a bracket, or you can grab it from the top lip and then pull straight down. You do not ever want to pinch the can. Ever. Inside of here is basically saran wrap. A few chemical differences, but there's some ra saran wrap and a very thin piece of metal. Usually aluminum or nickel plate sheet, something like that. And it's two pieces of saran wrap sandwiched in between a piece of over the edges of a piece of aluminum and it's spiral wrapped. And then um, the dielectric process that takes place in here is an oil filled can. There's oil in here. And so we don't want to pinch, pinch the body. That's why these straps are made so that the feet bow away from each side of the can. And we're mounting this to a perfectly flat substrate. So we want to provide enough support that the the oil filled can cannot move, but we don't want to be able to put any pressure to where we can bend this outer casing at all. Stupid important. So, and then we've got our RF junk supplied bias boards that we've got to install, but that's that's later on down the road. First, I want to get the subboard in with the cans and the power supply. That's my goal. Whew. Okay, off to do 12 volt supply. Yay. Well, I'm going to tell you, this is the end of a freaking long day right now. This has taken all afternoon to get this far. I told you I was going to do it, and I still feel it's necessary. So that's exactly how much double side stick tape I'm going to use. I'm digging these new scissors. I was helping a friend do a solar install thing this last weekend, or the weekend before last, or this last weekend. I don't know. It's all running together. These really nice set of red-handled scissors I've had forever. And they are just missing now. I think they might have gotten added to his collection of stuff. Which, if that's the case, so be it. So we finally got our shelves fabricated and all put together. We got all the little subsystems that sit underneath the shelf wired. Now, in theory, theory, I left myself enough real estate underneath these shelves to make it so that I have room to reach in there and do what I need to do if I need to do anything, right? theory. I don't want to try it. Once these things go in, I don't want to have to take them back out again. So, I've double and quadruple checked and squirted Loctite and all kinds of stuff down in there to make sure nothing's going to move around on us in the future. This would obviously be one of the tool or the things that we'd have to change. This cap. We'd have to add a little bit of voltage, meaning we'd have to add another capacitor if we decided to run that top, 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 top tap. 
Now, as you guys seen in the previous segment of Vajeo, um, I'm running the 4200 volt tap and I'm going to make adjustments on the primary side, not on the secondary side. And I think that'll get us dialed in. Cap is never coming off. Uh uh, ain't happening. So, seeing how stupidly valuable these caps are. Nice, good, thick, heavy duty aluminum plate. Thick heavy duty strap, good heavy duty all thread, got ourselves a platform. Now, we're going through a half inch thick sheet of aluminum and then some other fun stuff on the bottom side of that that makes up the cabinet. Let's see where I put my giant bag of hardware for this particular portion of it. This is it. This is it. Thinking of my good friend Vernon today. Built a power supply for Vernon one time. He's down in Texas. And I uh, had to take the power supply apart. He goes, man, you didn't deburr any of the, the screws that you cut. Goes, man, you gotta you're gonna have to purchase yourself a sander or something. Or get a grinder and make it so that you can bevel out the top corners of these things and deburr them. And I promptly went out and did just that, and I was thinking of him today as I was trimming these back. Now, because we're going into some, such piece of uh, substantial metal, I don't think I need to worry that much about the washer. That is getting a little busy on the inside of there. The floor is getting very full. See the nuts a quarter. That should work. Set her for about an inch. Eh, three fourths. Right at three fourths. So let's see, half. Nuts a quarter. Uh, I should set this at about one. Yeah.
that's it. So now, this one closest to the edge is the easiest one to get to. That looks good. Good clearances. That's solid. All right. I'm excited about this because this represents to me in my head um, over a third of the way through. But half the fab work. Let's see if we can sneak our hand into this back one. Oh, come on, nut. This has been the story of this entire build. I feel kind of stupid because this is one thing I did not take into account. What was the height clearance of this thing? Versus my big ass. Meaty hands. Uh, got it. Okay. Let's see if we can get this front one. Uh, I have cut and scraped the crap out of my hands on this build. Good lord. All right. Two. I'm gonna adjust here. Pictures that. Damn. Okay, camp bank and power supply board number two. All right, now. And like Flynn. Whew. It's crowded, but this will work. And I can come back tomorrow and 
I want to hand tie some of the stuff up and there's a lot of stuff I want to do yet. Um, putting the lipstick on the pig per se. All right. Oh. Okay. Let's get this puppy in. Now, for the painful ones, and hopefully won't throw my shoulder out doing this. Just stay right up in here. Right there. A lot of little clicking for a whole lot of little action. All right, let's try to get this last one in here. I'm done. I'm going in the house. Salt head, you can bend down. There you go. Okay. I surrender. Woo! It's in there. Boy, oh boy. I'm so tired of this. Every time I turn around, I'm bleeding from this box. Well, I got the cure for that.
I do, I got the cure for this. Where'd I put it? Ah, here it is. Carb cleaner. Yep. All that excitement over a little tiny scratch. <laughs> right there. Woo! But the tattoo came out unscathed. Yay, me! <laughs> uh, I dare you to spray carb cleaner on your arm when you cut it open. It tingles just a little. <laughs> Helps to be nuts in this job, by the way, too. It's still leaking. Quit it. So, we had a small problem. Um, the brown turd shitbox kickers, when they brought this thing here, the cardboard that these transformers was in, were in, um, man, they beat the brakes off the iron, off the, the cardboard, and the cardboard was rubbing up against the data sticker. Now, I called EPD, and they were cool enough to send me new data stickers. So let's let's pause right here, and we'll give the official plug to EPD. That's all their contact information, and I'll make sure to put it in the comments below. And this particular build is uh, LT31604, okay, 19.6 kVA, single phase, 60 hertz, CCS, okay, so 220, 230, 240, secondary, top tap, very, very top of the tap, 5,600 volts at 3.5 amps. 4,200 volts, 3,500 volts on the bottom tap, approximately about five and a half amps. So they were cool enough to send me new data stickers for this thing. And we're going to put them right here on the transformer. I called them. I said, man, listen, I can't. My customers aren't going to settle for that. They're going to want a data sticker that they can read and brag to their buddies about, which is truthful. So, as we can clearly see, clearly see these are the exact same data tag. 3,500 volts, 3,500 volts, 4,200 volts, 4,800, 500, or 5,600 volts, 5,600 volts, 3.5 amps, LT3, LT3, 19.6 kVA. Exactly the same data tag and we're doing this so that whoever ends up buying this thing in the future if somebody ever does Which I highly doubt I have a feeling these guys are want, gonna want to get buried with these boxes um, They'll have this as a reference all right, let's do the other one. This is the Exorcist The other one was the demon Exact same data tag. You guys remember this. That's their contact number. 919-365-9199. For this particular piece of iron. And they can facilitate building you anything your heart will ever desire. No joke. Got a vacuum and a vacuum, and it seems like I'm still finding little bits of stuff in this. Okay, so now the whole high voltage has been wired on both of these. This is the back side of the Demon. This is the front side of the Exorcist. So then instead of doing two separate hunks of video, we're going to do one. These are wired exactly the same from each other. Okay, so we've got our secondary voltage, which comes in, runs down through these high voltage leads, hits the diodes. Runs up through the diodes, gets converted into direct current. This is our positive lead right here, runs off and runs over here to our glitches. And then our ground comes off of over here, 
and it shows up right here on the other side of our capacitor board, or right on the other side attached to our capacitor. So our ground lead that goes up to our bleeders, up there, and so our hot lead that runs up to our bleeders, up there. It's real simple. Now, I was doing a pal talk thing where I was showing off the inside of this. Uh, my friend White Cloud was doing a two pill video on how to build a two pill and he did it in like 40 minutes or whatever. <clears throat> um, so I decided I'd show my, turn the camera on and show me working on this as I was wiring up all the high voltage stuff. So our positive wire comes out here and hits the capacitor bank. So now this whole circuit's live. Now what we choose to do with this here is how it goes back to the cabinet as far as ground. There's a little trick that's involved with that, and also most of our metering is done on the ground side of the circuit, by the way. At least on our amperage and that kind of thing is all done on the ground side. So off of here, I'll probably build another little board that stands off right here and holds the high voltage metering resistor, which knocks the voltage down, which will run that lead around up to the front to drive our plate voltmeter. Now, one of the questions I got fielded when I was in Pal Talk earlier today was, what's the deal with the 30 amp power supply? Well, we got a bunch of 12 volt circuits inside this thing. We have fans. Our keying circuit, all that kind of stuff is all run off 12 volts. Now, I could probably get away with using like a little 5 amp power supply and be perfectly fine. I had 30 ampers sitting here, so we're going to have a little bit of headroom. Now, I've saved this little spot down here in the cabinet for these guys right here this is a uh, 5 amp switch supply now this supply is going to be in here to do one job and one job only when you go and open the cabinet there's going to be a pressure sensor on the front it's going to do two things <laughs> not one thing it's, pardon me it's going to do one thing there's going to be a little switch that's on the door when the door opens it's going to turn on a little light so when a guy's in the dark, he can see what the switches are. And this will be constantly on all the time, this little guy. Not switched by any means. It's just going to be on and alive. And it's going to go right down in here, roughly. Maybe orientated like this. We'll see. I'm not there yet. So. The high voltage side on both of these is completely wired and ready to go. Um, I might do a test a little bit later on to make sure everything is tits, but I'm sure it is. We'll use a 220 Variac and we'll bring the voltage on on the primary side, not using the soft start circuit. We'll test it last. Um, we're going to bring the voltage up real slow and see if we got any leak issues. Any of those kinds of things. Um, we'll bring it up really, really slow, and then we'll go way past where it's going to work at because I can overclock. I can go up to 260 volts on this this new 220 Variac that I've got. Just every time. See? Little tiny bits of fiberglass. See, down in here is a tiny piece of aluminum. I'm going to blow this out real good with the air compressor before I'm done. So... Yeehaw. High voltage is done. Most of the low voltage is done. And actually, this is where I've got to stop on these por this portion of the deck. So I'm going to wheel these aside. And now it's time to start making the magic up here in the top. Can we say amp deck time? Whoop, whoop. <laughs> here we go. Let's see. What do I need now? I need a 3,000. Okay. Well, grab Lee's old tube. It's a dud. It's a dud and it's a dud. See? 100% dud. This thing shorts over, you get about 3,000 or, 3, or so volts on it and this tube just goes <laughs> boop. It's, it. it's done short. So, save it for a core. It comes in handy for things like this. Okay, let's start walking you through everything that I got going on here on the workbench at this second. This is one of two cabinets. And I took it out of the Exorcist box, this one here. And I very lightly put it together with its internal construction just so I could get um, a dimensional shape and size for me to help visualize what I needed to do for uh, shelf height and so on in the deck. 
So I am going to have to take this all the way back apart because we're going to go walk through the steps of what we got to do here. There's a lot of little visualization that goes on with this. So we're going to come back to that. But what I have here, which I'm going to show you guys. Oh, come on, tripod. What I have here is an unmolested one. So let me get this out of the way. Careful not to scratch it. We have an unmolested one. Now, it's the way it comes. You guys seen me fight with this, and I got a lot of comments. Man, that was some funny shit. Yeah, the two box deal. Yeah, that's what was in the two boxes. It was these. Had me laughing. I watched it. I watched that segment of video and oh, wow, that was that was pretty priceless there, buddy. So when they show up, they're gonna come in flats like this. Now this is an internal panel. And what some guys like to do is they'll attach their tuners to the back side of these things. Walk over here and open this tote up. Here's one of the tuners that we're going to use right here. It's a vacuum tuner. And some guys like to mount these just like this. And then they'll have just the nipple sticking through the deck. Um, I think I might be in a tight squeak for space, so I don't know if we're going to be able to go that route. That and everything's going to be closed behind doors for the most part. So like on my big box over there, Vader, I had to uh, I put panels on the outside. I mounted the deck on the inside and everybody's like, wait, what, uh, uh. They couldn't, they couldn't visually see it in their head, right? So I've got all this exposed stuff. Basically the tuner mounted right to the face of the deck. Deck sits back in there. I get it all tuned the way I want. I put the plate on it because I only talk on one frequency. I don't have to retune it. So I haven't retuned it in probably, well, ever since I put the 40,000 in there. So it's been a year or better. <clears throat> it's the hardest you can be to a tube, by the way, you guys. These are your side panels, by the way. Hardest you're ever going to be to the tube is when it's here in the tuning process of it. Once you get your stuff tuned, if you're a mono frequency user, a mono band user, leave it alone. This is our inner deck. This is where most of the joy is going to take place. It's going to be bolted and attached to this piece of aluminum. These are very expensive, very hard to find, but very good components that come from Japan. And that's Japan. So, one of the things that I have to create space for is this high voltage pass through. Um, I do not like uh, the Molen connectors, the little twist Henry connectors. Not a fan of those. Really not a fan of those. I have a tendency to fail. They're not very well insulated. But the hardest thing that I have to visualize in my head is this here. This little Dayton blower that's going to go in here. A Rotan Dayton blower. This thing is pretty scooch and cool moves a lot of air but I'm not I don't feel I'm gonna have enough real estate off the back of the amplifier to do normal installation let me show you what I've tried this yet but I'm pretty sure that I'm not gonna have enough space but I might but I won't see what I'm saying this distance from here to here will not work so that means I have to come up with another creative solution on how to mount this. Well, what I could do, and what is definitely an option, is I could set the deck back like this. Way back in the cabinet. Okay? 
and then hang the blower off the bottom, which is an option. A lot of guys have done this. Hang the blower down here off the bottom. See what I'm saying? It's a total option. It kind of screws me up a little bit on my design for the front side, which is over here. I want to have a Lexan sheet that comes up to the very bottom edge of this deck to keep my customers from sticking their fingers in there and getting themselves a little bit of a, a tickle. As in like a tickle that's going to kill you and it's going to hurt the entire time while dying. So my solution to that is I set it 10 forward like that. Now the other option is I hang the blower off the front side of the box. Once again, has a chance of interfering with the high voltage that and then it puts the noisiest part of the, the box the closest to the front which is bad hence the reason we did all the sound ending material in the previous segment but there's yet another solution so our other possible solution is this is the inside of the mock-up cabinet and we're gonna say for a sake of argument we're gonna have this be the back side of the amplifier now we've got our floor, okay, so it means we've got a total of what? About nine and three fourths of an inch worth of depth. Now, when you're specking out your cabinet for your deck, I've got an inch and a half worth of room on each side of the cabinet <clears throat> for growth in the future. So let's say the guy wants to go to a pair of threes. Can we theoretically leave enough room inside of here to do that? Mm, yeah, we can. It'd be better if we just went and got him a bigger deck. Or let's say he wants to do a set of sixes or a six or something like that. It'd be easier just to do the deck that way. But what we have to visualize out in our head is all the other little things. So from the top of the anode down to the base, is seven and a half inches. So that means from the top of this titty to the top of the deck I'm gonna have what? About an inch and a half, almost two inches worth of clearance, which is perfect for the voltage that this runs at. Well now where am I gonna put this? I put this out in the middle of the deck? I mean we could. It's totally possible. If I put it too close to the edge of the cabinet, there's so much energy taking place here. You've got all the RF energy plus the, the DC voltage that's being applied to this anode. So we like to space things off just a little bit. And we're going to say inch and a half. And so for the future, just in case he decides he wants to run a six in the same enclosure, we'll say two and a half inches out. Roughly two and a half inches over. Now, when we go to put this together, there's going to be. I want to go to three inches. I remember that. <clears throat> I did this with one of my own enclosures. I put the three in here and it got really happy and ran really good. And then I went to put the six in there and the anode on the six, which is an inch and some schmoo bigger all the way around. It was too close to the edge of the cabinet and I was having arcing issues. And I tried to put Teflon on there and it still would arc over. Um, so, what we have to think about. This is going to be our rough, rough, rough location of the tube. Other option is to do something crazy like this. We shear off this side of the blower. Or take it off. This is actually an insert. Take it off. And mount the blower inside the deck with an opening over here in this back corner that the air goes in. Now, everybody in radio land is freaking out right now. That won't work. I can hear them saying it. The traditional way of cooling a 3000 is this. Okay. Let me stop here for a second and I want to point you guys out to something. This is not your typical chimney. 
This is an incredibly custom made piece of Teflon. Our friends over at ICA Manufacturing, the same people that we buy most of our cabinets from, most of our boards are heat sinks, and this particular enclosure that we're working with, ICA.com, hooked me up with Teflon. Now I noticed about a million years ago that they sell Teflon and it was buried on the back side of the annals of their page. Now the problem I had with that was that dimensionally, let's see if I can dig some of this stuff out here for you guys, their dimensions on their tubes, nothing fit. And I mean, Son of a donkey frickin' okay. <clears throat> Dimensionally, none of their Teflon fit. Apologize for the delay. So when I bought my very first piece of Teflon for them, I had it spec it for a 40. <laughs> but the first piece of Teflon I ended up using for it was for a 10. That is the Teflon for a 10,000. At least it's what it was. Well, here's the small problem we have with the 10. Here's a 10,000 tube, right here, that's a 3CX 10,000 A7, it no fit, it no fit, and actually there's a gap that takes place here even for a 6, but this fits just barely around the outside of a 6. So when I went to do this project, I went to hit them guys up, now oh, here, I'll give you a dimensional size. This is roughly the same size as a 10. Remember, this is the chimney for a 3. Okay. Here's the custom piece of Teflon I had to have cut for my 40. This, this ring here. Okay. But the way I have and I do my cooling is what I'm going to explain to you guys now. So when I went to go get this chimney from them guys, I said, let's let's slow down and take a hot minute. And me and Michelle over at ICA, we worked on this. And Michelle instantly seen what was wrong. She goes, man, we don't ever sell any of these. And I said, I don't know. I think that they're the wrong size. I haven't had a time to go and look at dimensionals. Well, most of the ant building industry uses a little tiny sheet of Teflon that they'll wrap around the tube and then they'll either hold it together with zip ties or they'll put pop rivets in it, which is stupid. I'm not saying it's wrong because it works. Just me personally, stupid. It's like voted for Carlos kind of silliness. <clears throat> the way the rest of the amp universe thinks is that the cool air has to come from the bottom. So we put pressure in the bottom side of the deck and then we blow exhaust air out the top. It's not the way I do things. I traveled to this guy's house one time. I watched a bunch of really cool stuff. He was way in another league all by himself. And one of the things I took away from that entire mess is that his chimney goes to the top of the deck, just like that. And I stood there, and it was one of them hallelujah moments. The, the, the light comes on, you know, your, your little schmeck starts to go, because you start, you're like, man, why didn't I ever think about that? And um, your brain starts to go, wait a minute. Now, at that time, I was running a 3000 that I had built, and it was built from a used Henry generator deck. I didn't know any different. Contrary to popular belief, none of us are actually born knowing any of this shit. We have to learn it, <laughs> okay? So I took something that was working and started tinkering with it, and I hated the limitations of the Henry deck. Hated it. Hated. Hated. With a fervor and a passion, hated that deck. I had all these holes drilled in the floor because I had so much air restriction going on. And I had tank coil heating issues. And I had 
all kinds of other problems that were going on in the box because there was no air circulation. The problem with chilling your deck this way is that you have this bunch of bleed over air that flows around inside the box before it just kind of meanders its way out. I looked at what he had going on, and by the way, the guy I keep talking about is Prime, by the way. His is a top cooled, and he's got his blower sitting over here on the top of his deck, on one of his air cooled decks, one of like 30 I seen that day. He's a collector. When he makes something, he keeps it. He's like, well, that was Gen 1, Gen 2, and he'll walk you through it. He'll literally show you, and you can see the progression of thought, and it's brilliant. It's absolutely brilliant. One of his heating and air conditioning guys he had working for him explained to him that the more time you have air move around a corner, around a sharp edge, or has to go through a forced orifice, you're going to have restriction. So why not just put the exhaust port on the top and let all the air meander around inside the cabinet around all the different components and over everything else and then come out. So what he did is he took it to another place. He has holes drilled in the bottom of his deck to cool his filament on the bottom side. And then he's got vents on the bottom. But 99% of the air comes out of the top. But the air blows in or runs across all the components you have to worry about heating. The tank coil, that kind of thing. And as I'm standing there and I'm looking inside this deck, I was like, looking at all the beautiful silver work on the inside of this deck, I was like, well, there's nothing discolored. There's no heating. There's no nothing. I'm like, you've taken this to 80,000? He goes, yeah, we'll take it to 80,000 tomorrow. We took it to 88,000 watts or something. Let everything cool off. High voltage bleed down. Opened up the deck. Looked inside. No discolorization. I was like, whoa. Mind blown as a young ant builder. Blown, right? So, so when I go to build myself a real big box... Air parentheses, you know, because according to some, I'm still a complete mud duck, which is probably true, and I'm very comfortable with that. I embrace that. Um, when I go to build a little, little bit something bigger, which was a 10, then immediately to a 15, then not too long after that, a 20, and then back to the 15, because I liked how the 15 ran a little bit differently. And, a, and then I was going to go to a pair of 15s, and now I was thinking about doing a pair of 20s, and then I found the, the second to last 40,000 on Earth and went and bought it, and then I went and bought the last 40,000. I guess. Anyhow, I did the top cooling. Because if you limit the amount of restriction that goes on with air movement, you're going to get a higher velocity. Okay, That's the whole point of this little tirade I just went on. So, I couldn't find anybody. Now, I found the guy since then. I couldn't At the time, I couldn't find anybody that would be willing to sell me thick Teflon. The reason this is important is because you can drill and tap into this Teflon and mount it to the lid. Think. Make sense? Thick. Good virgin, virgin Teflon. This is for the Demon. This is the one for the Exorcist. Exactly the same. ICAManufacturing.com we spent a whole week looking at data sheets, me and Michelle, confirming height depths. <clears throat> Even shot our little quick orientation video because you got to remember, this is somebody on the outside trying to help us as sea beers and trying to get herself very quickly schooled up on the dimensions that she needs. Now, this woman is brilliant. And I mean brilliant. She has got a huge career in doing mechanical drawings, right? So to look at a data sheet for her and then look at the, the actual physical plot plan of the tube, man, she was on it like Donkey Kong, but she had to do it in her spare time because she was busy running the manufacturing side of the business and helping Tony do that. So you guys got to remember that there's a lot of love that goes into each one of these parts, these cabinets and these chimneys. If you don't use these chimneys from this point forward after watching this video, um... There's something wrong, wonky and wrong in your head. The nice thing about this this chimney also is that it's so heavy that I don't care what blower you put on the bottom of this, it's never going to have enough air pressure to push this up. Now, I also want you to see how tight the fitting is on that tube. Perfectly machined for a 3000. Now, this is a new product for them that they're giving us right here. Because I called them up and said, hey, let's do this. And can we do this? 
And they said, well, yeah, we can totally can do that. And between a bunch of texting back and forth and a couple late night phone calls and a little quick educational video, like telling her, these are the parts and this is where, you know, I mean, literally going, so the cabinet's going to go to this flange lid here. And then you need to make sure that you've got an inch and a half to two inches of overhang, depending on what tube it is. I mean, we talked about everything. She's like, I'm on it. Never gotten to meet her yet. <clears throat> we are planning on going back there. Um, officially got the invite from Tony here about a month ago. And he told me, he goes, when you come out, make sure to bring your camera because I want everybody to have a tour. And I said, cool, you want a free video? No problem. I'm going to New York, boys and girls. <clears throat> I got a lot of equipment back there and I can't wait to meet some of my guys. I can't because we're going to have a party. Party, party. Okay. Back on track. Venting. I ordered this fan with this possibility in mind. All the little guts for this motor are inside of here. Here. Behind the RF shield because this thing is made completely of steel. Not aluminum, not plastic, steel. So if I mount this inside the deck, I could even mount it over here in the flipping side corner if I wanted to. The air is going to curl around inside this box and bang into every flipping thing. And as it's doing that, it's causing wake turbulence. The turbulence is good. If I just had a flat pressure behind this tube, you're not going to get the same amount of volume through the base of this tube. As if, even if I had a little fan in here to cause turbulence, that tumbling air is going to allow more volume to move through. Now, the other pro to venting from the top side of the deck versus the bottom side of the deck is the amount of exposure the tube gets to air. Let me show you what I mean. All the air has to move up through that little gap. This little gap right here. This little gap. Even with, now this is why iMac has got fiberglass chimneys that bell out so that it allows them to get more air volume and then they can ramp the air into the tube. Because that little gap, this little tiny gap is all that you're going to be able to get pressurized air from versus all of this. Think about it. They'll have air flow in and around and under and by and by the porcelain and more volume. More volume. More volume. So I don't know. This is where I'm gonna put my head down in my hands and start thinking pretty hard and heavy, but thank you, Michelle. Publicly, I'm thanking you and probably in front of four or five thousand people for taking the time to help all of us guys out with our builds and helping us create more fun, better, more better projects. ICA Manufacturing. Whole section, Teflon chimneys. Check them out. I'm telling you, you won't regret using this stuff. And they're not that overly expensive. We were talking like maybe a hundred bucks. I don't even remember what I paid for these. It was months and far, five months ago, six months ago when I ordered these. But they've been up there sitting on the web page waiting for me to do this little plug. Don't be surprised if you see a separate little video that I produce for them, just like I have done with RF Junk, and it shows up on their web page talking about the advantages of a machined Teflon chimney. Okay, got that out of our system. Yay! Quantag. What do we got going on here, George? Oh, we got a wire that popped out. Okay. This here. Won't fit in a hole. Spit on it, man. Still won't fit in a hole. Spit on it some more, man. Oh, it fit in a hole. All right. I'm assuming, you know, assumption, the mother of all F-ups. If I plug this in and it goes boom, I'm blaming you guys. Because it's called camera pressure. The capacitor.
capacitor that allows the blower to switch popped off. Quintag. That's how loud this fan is. Which is what I call pitch perfect. It's a regular envelope. Two folded up pieces of paper in it. Beep. That's so quiet. I wish I would have known about these when I was building my 40. I got these huge, huge Roton blowers inside of that thing, and it kind of make monsters amount of noise. But all I got to do is deaden this sound that comes from this side, just a wee little bit. CFM blower. Which is stupid quiet. Hmm. Okay. Let's take a, a quick minute and talk about death in a bottle. This is stuff that can kill you. It's got arsenic in it. Well, basically everything I work with over here is something that's eventually got some kind of level of toxicity to it that's going to either cause my dingus to rot and fall off, my teeth to come out of my head, or me to go completely insane, which I think I've already sniffed a couple too many of these fumes. Um, this is condensed... Uh, silver, iodine, da 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 da. When I, when I taught myself how to do this, I, re I got really into the chemistry, and because of the power of the computer gargler, you can go teach yourself anything anymore, right? So if you want to learn how to do this, Google it. Um, I use two Home Depot buckets, and I use a silver bars, an electrode, and an anode, and actually two of them. Suspend the solution, plus then I kick this up a notch with uh, some silver iodine solution that I've got. And the end result is this. Beautiful silver plated components. Now, in theory, what you'd want to do is first, you would, you're going to etch this. We have to etch this in a very light acid. Then we rinse that in distilled water. And this was one of the very first pieces I made four or five years ago and as we can clearly see it's not tarnished or degraded in any way um, what I didn't know about though was sealing the ends of the coil which I'll cover <laughs> we'll cover that in a little bit later segment we actually solder the ends shut because you can plate the, so the solder as well um, the tricks of bending the stuff smooth usually involve salt and sand which I'll also cover but I bought just for this particular build three new bottles of solution and they will all be completely depleted and you can find this stuff on, on eBay pretty easy this uh, this Kronhan silver plating solution but uh, inside these bottles is poison and death and during the electro plating process produces gas poison and death death all the way around death <clears throat> so the uh, all the parts on the inside of my 40 are completely silvered right everything silver tank coil everything everything in these threes is going to be completely silver plated as well but in theory you'd want to etch this to remove any oil from it i've got this stuff which is extreme death in a can this will cause birth defects this will cause you to basically die this solution here um, this is good up to 36,000 kva this comes out of a company in nevada they will not sell you this 
because you have to export it out of the state. I had to sign a non-export agreement to the state of California specifically on for the this. back, the hazardous materials data sheet that's on the back. Um, skin eye irritation, respiratory tract irritation, swallowing will cause death, cirrhosis, and instant irritation. Death, explosive, flammable. It's cool stuff. But this is what we, uh, we clean most of our copper with around here cover that in another segment as well you'd want to etch this then you're gonna go and you put a nickel plate on it because the nickels a lot harder than the silver okay so when most people think of silver plating something they think about uh, I think your jewelry and stuff okay well underneath the silver plating is gonna be a nickel finish and the nickel finish has a tendency to react with your skin oil as well so the nickel is really really hard um, it's, it's the reason that they put down a nickel finish on stuff that they chrome as well because chrome is really soft But the nickel plating that's underneath is really hard. I skip over the nickel plating because it's not necessary It's absolutely not necessary. This is a non-wear non-exposed non-rub component. Okay This is the scientist side of my brain the engineer side of my head kicking in a little bit um, There's no wear and there's absolutely zero electrical difference between nickel plated silver plated copper versus just silver direct silver plated copper and copper does a beautiful job taking on silver plate Beautiful as we know as we can clearly see here beautiful We're being a four-year-old part that gets manhandled by pretty much everybody that ever comes in here and it's not Corroded or any it's just silver plating. It's this solution that I kick up with some silver iodine I can't even remember the specific name. Somebody's going to drag me on a cross for that. I just know it. This is the route we're going to go. We're going to silver plate everything. Everything that touches the tube and anything that has anything to do with any kind of RF is going to get a silver plating. So, wanted to cover that. Covered the chimneys. Last but not least, I wanted to cover the sockets. Let me now, prep for I that. I cannot find my Henry Regenerator socket, which is an actual IMAX socket. If you guys could see this room I was standing in and seeing the train wreck it slowly developed into, it's embarrassing, but it is the space that I'm stuck working in for the moment. So, I mean, I've got two shelves that are just committed to sockets, and I cannot find... I had one Henry socket left that I keep around for demonstration and talking purposes, and I cannot find it. This is a Harris 3000 socket. This come out of a Harris transmitter, I do believe. Harris or... They come out of a trans transmitter. Um, I bought a, a, a lot of tubes from a guy that were supposed to be good, and some of them turned out to be duds, and the other ones are just low in RF output completely. And one of the things he threw in on the deal was some sockets for 3000s. This has some very old vintage finger stock in it. And how this works is it grabs the bottom side of the tube and allows your filament to go in. Okay. That is a fairly decent socket. This is very robust. Um, the downside is I didn't get the finger stock for the grid ring, okay? So, this is one way to go. I'm going to show you the better way to go. These two little pieces, they come from RF Junk. Once again, our buddy over at RF Junk comes up. This nice billeted machined piece of aluminum bolts directly onto here and it gives you two hookups for your filament. And this here. Now, this being said, I happen to know for a fact there's a guy that lives in my town. Some of you guys that live in California can actually hear him because he runs around on a ground plane and his favorite thing in the world is to try and make me look bad. But in the same note, I happen to know for a fact, an absolute fact, because I have pictures of it, the inside of his 3000, there are, um, there's a hose clamp holding the 3000 to the inside of the deck hose clamp hooking up the filament on the bottom side and a PL259 connector that has been cut like one of these has been cut this way the guts have been knocked out has been cut this way and is held on with a hose clamp and that's how he's feeding the filament current the bottom side of the tube um, I am not that guy I can't build to that level I cannot I love this sexy body I'm in I love it okay so RF junk has produced this beautiful adapter for the bottom of a 3000 we have two of these and allows more surface more surface contact which means more surface to conduct juice 
Now, what I want my friend at RF Parts or uh, RF Junk to do is to create me a third collet that goes around the bottom of this that is based off this same technology that we could then in turn machine holes into that would allow us to attach this to the bottom side of the amp deck. So you can slide the tube in, boom, into the hole, which is going to be what a two and a half or whatever inch opening, and you're going to have your machined holes. Tighten it down to hold the tube in place and come along with an Allen wrench and tighten it and the tube can never pull out the deck. Which I thought would be an awesome idea, especially for the mobile guys. The guys that run 3000s in their mobiles. Um, I don't know about you, I'd be terrified that the tube's going to come out of the socket every time I hit a bump. So I don't know how the mobile guys overcome that. Um, I don't know. I'm pretty sure you could machine out some really trick-ass parts, but I thought that this would be fun for my friends at RF Junk to play with. So I'm sure when he sees this video coming out on Monday or Sunday evening of this week, he's going to be like, Ah, oh, I get you, BBI. Because I tried to describe it to him on the phone. He's like, what? No, I just use washers to hold it down. I'm like, yeah, well, that's the same thing I'm going to do, but I want to do it differently. We're out of time. We don't have time. I'm out of time, and we're going to have to move forward, but... If he does ever come out with an update, I can almost guarantee you the two guys that own these particular boxes and I'm working on are going to be beating down my door to get me to put those updates in there, but even though it's not necessary. Uh, my personal three, my personal six uses these. Now, you guys are be like, well, this is nothing new. We used to be able to buy those on eBay. That's right. Same guy. <clears throat> the same dude that used to sell these on eBay quit putting them on eBay and now sells them on his own webpage. That's rfjunk.com. So we've talked about ICA manufacturing and rfjunk.com. Write it down, go explore the web pages. You'll be shocked what you find. Shocked. So we've got those bases covered. Now I gotta figure out how to put these two giant totes worth of parts and turn them into something we can use. Wish me luck folks. I got two weeks planned for just this portion of the build. For a reason. Fun, right? Well, I think the first thing I need to do is come up with mounting brackets to hold the deck in place, the actual RF deck. And then we gotta figure out ourselves a layout plan. Let me show you what I mean. Okay, now. I'm going to show you one of my most valuable tools I have in my entire shop. It's really special to me. I could get a different tool, but I like this tool. It's mine. And it was given to me by my daughter. My Rainbow Warrior pencil. Yep. My Bruce Jenner friendly pencil. Listen. When you go to your seven-year-old daughter who's really into art and she has a pencil and she says to you, or you say to her, sweetie, I need to get a pencil from you. Which one out of your 10,000 of them do you want? Because my kid does not want for anything. She's got like everything. And she's got a horse for God's sake. 13-year-old girl doesn't has her own horse, full-grown horse, right? She goes and she rummages around. The first pencil she gave me and I wore it down to where it was about that big. And I've told this story many times, but I'm gonna force all of you to endure it one more time. It was glitter covered and gold, stripper glitter even, because every time I'd use it, a little bit of glitter would stay with me. I'd go in the house and I'd like rub my face, you know, and wife would be like, oh, you used a stripper pencil, didn't you? I'm like, yeah, I did, babe. I sharpened this on my belt sander. Not even ashamed to say it. So I used that for, let's see, seven, eight, nine, 10. I used that till she was 10 or 11. So she's about 10 or 11 years old. I went in and I said, sweetie, I need another pencil. And she looks at me, she goes, for what dad? And I said, so I can use it to mark stuff on cabinets and draw things out that I can easily erase. And she goes, oh, okay. And she reaches over and she hands me the rainbow warrior pencil. There it is. So we're going to embrace it. Okay. So now, let's say we have to get a layout. This is the back of the cabinet. So we have to start visualizing where we're going to put things. So we have several things that are going to need to take place here. We're going to need to put 
air inside the cabinet some way and I'd really like to do it off the back side of this box even if that means I mount the blower on the outside and then have to custom make a duct of some kind which is an option cut a hole in this thing and then weld to this and the guys at ICA were cool enough to hook me up with a cabinet that had not been cleared. This is a non-cleared cabinet. It will be cleared when it leaves here. So if I needed to, my brain was thinking, if I need to do anything crazy like this, I won't have to go back and grind the powder coat, the clear coat, or any other chemical process to get down to the bare metal so I can weld on it. Okay. Um, we're going to just say that this is our intake. This, this other half of my 4 inch, 120 millimeter, $400 die. This thing is stupid expensive, by the way. And incredible to find all by itself. Like it, it's another whole story. I ended up buying this from one lot. I got the actual die that goes on the inside of this from another lot. And then the downsized shaft, I ended up buying that. Yes, this is the die that took the end of my finger off, which still to this day hurts, and I don't have any feeling on the tip of my finger. So i got to be really careful, one, that I don't burn myself, and two, that I don't cut the end of my finger open. The other thing that we have to have passing through here is our high-voltage pass-through. It's a 10,000 rated capacitor to pass through into the deck. Then we've got other things that have got to go on. We've got to have the RF come out. And we are going to use PL259s. Anything past the 3000, I would strongly suggest that you start thinking about doing something else. LC, 7 8 DIN, something like that. But a PL259, we're right on the magical cusp of what this thing can handle. So we're going to have RF coming out. We'll pretend it's a pillbox. We've got RF coming in. Okay. And then we've got to have our filament. Now normally what I've done in the past is I'll picture a window out of the corner of the cabinet, like over here. And in this case I'll probably end up putting red fiberglass board back over here. And then have some bolts for our filament to come inside to our induction chokes that are going to take place to go over to our socket. Now what else do we need to have coming in and out of this deck? Mental exercise. Well, we have to have some kind of plug jack, which my favorite thing to do is use a mic jack because everything that's going on inside of here is very low voltage for the most part and low amperage. We've got to have the ability to activate the relays inside the deck and then we also have to have the ability to be able to get power to the fan if I'm going to put it internal. So it's going to give us one leg for ground, which is important. You want to keep it isolated from cabinet ground for the relays. One leg for your DC plus for your what? Say it with me. For what? Say it with me. Yes, that's right. Your, re your relay. Then you're going to have your return. Return for your 110. And then you're going to have your source of generation. 10 volt but like an amp no current no current maybe an amp so we've got to get ourselves a very precise cabinet layout plan on the back and that's what I'm gonna work on now so on that note I'm gonna spool away and go work on that when I come back I'm gonna actually have stuff all drawn out here on nice and pretty and uh, I'm gonna make it so it's transferable which is really stupid important that we can transfer this from this to the other one because everything has to be exactly the same. I like to have the RF coming in and out. Now normally what I would do is I'd put the output up here on the top. That allows you to circumvent the hassle of trying to get the RF to go from the upper to the bottom portion of the deck without having any signal crossover internally with any of the other circuitry here. Um, usually you want to sandwich your relays, your top and your bottom relays, so that they're occupying roughly the same real estate top and bottom on the board so you can bolt them together. That allows you to 
shorten up your leads internally, which we'll cover here in just a minute. So yeah, I gotta sit here and think. I gotta figure out really, what I've really gotta figure out is what I wanna do with my fan. If I mount it internally, I still need to figure out how I can mount it on some rubber so we're not turning all of this box and everything the box touches into a big giant resonant speaker for the fan vibration, which is really important. Or if we put it out on side, then all we do is we put a little rubber gasket between the fan body and then, yeah. I'll be back. Talking too much, not enough getting done. Well, instead of sitting around for hours on end um, thinking about the amp deck, I went ahead and I thought about the amp deck while I was completely populating this thing out. Um, I'm missing one wire off of each one of these, and it goes from here up to our bias board, which we've now mounted and installed, manufactured and wired in. Everything has a label on it, like time off timer, minimum five minutes. And what this allows us to do, and everything's now wired. All my control interfaces are wired. Everything is set up. I got wires run up to the front and routed up to the front of the cabinet. So all you got to do is provide it a case ground, flip on one switch, and it'll activate this, this unit, which will click down the freaking contactor, which will in turn turn on the DC sides of the, the amp and allow us to have keying function, and it'll bring all the blowers on. Everything is tied back to that switch. The next switch that is engaged, also on ground, is the filament, which will bring the filaments on, which will bring the tube to life. And then the final switch is our soft start circuit, which initializes this contactor, which starts the whole progression of the amp actually coming into functional mode. All the blower fan, all the cooler fans are now hooked up all the way around, all four of them. And I had to manufacture these little towers for the time on timers or time off timer to sit on. But that is our switch bias relay, and there's no point in wiring that up until I get foot pedal action, which will not happen until next week. Um, I manufactured all the metering boards, the uh, plate amp meter board and the voltage knockdown board for the plate voltage. I've got all my wires pre-run for my AC motors the actual blower for the amplifier, the tube itself, and then the lift fan, the exhaust fan that will sit on top to pull cool air through the entire cabinet. Power supplies are fully wired up, everything's ready to go. Um, I got about maybe five more minutes worth of work back here. Um, next week we are gonna knock into the side of the cabinet over here, our power wire input ports, our coax attachments, and our remote jack for a foot pedal, RCA jack. Do the same thing over here. And then I can fully move on to amp deck and then finish. That's where we're at. It doesn't seem like a lot, but I started on this at six o'clock this morning and it's now six o'clock in the evening. To fully run and route and label and mark everything soft start lead filament time on timer so on and so on and so on even what each one of the leads are that are attached to the 35 amp switcher they're labeled as well now what does slow you down a little bit is that i'm doing this with all teflon wire which takes a little bit more time to work with but i think it's worth it and uh, any place where i feel where there might be even a slight chance of abrasion i'm doing double double with uh, some uh, Teflon wrap. I think we're good to go. I think I'm going to head in the house and I'm going to call this a day. Gentlemen, see you next week. Part 3. Coming soon. I'll see ya. Bye.